Uh, welcome to our fireside chat on the future of research and innovation. The conversation today will be with Dr. Dietmar Berger, Chief Medical Officer, Global, Health of Global Head of Development at Sanofi, and fellow Research America board member, Dr. Elias Serhuni, Professor Emeritus, Radiology and Biomedical Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. Elias is also former director, National Institutes of Health, and that's a role he filled from 2002 to 2008. And I can say he's filled a lot of other roles too, but uh, to keep it short, I will turn it over to uh, Elias to begin the conversation. I'm really looking forward to hear the remarks. Elias. Thank you, Derek. And it's a real pleasure today to, to be with you all and, and to discuss with, uh, um, with Dietmar some of the major trends that are occurring in, in R&D and, and the first thing is, Dietmar, you've been very successful in your career, both as a medical officer and as well as a head of development. Um, I left Sanofi, I was head of R&D there before you came. And, and, and frankly, what you've done has been extraordinary. And the question I had for you though, is where we are today, what are the two, three things on your mind that are going to shape the future of R&D? No, the, thank you very much, Elias, and, and thanks for having me. And, and, you know, of course, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, right? So, so uh, I'm, I'm really happy to talk to you about that today. Um, I would like to, you know, just focus on what we've done at Sanofi exactly. And, and there are three areas that, that I would highlight. I mean, first of all, um, as a developer, as an as an R and D person, you know, obviously, I'm I'm really excited about the the portfolio, and and what I want to highlight is what we've done to build Sanofi's immunology pipeline. When when it comes to immunology, we have the ambition to be the leading immunology company, which means we have to think bigger and and dig deeper than than just a single drug. And in my mind, in immunology, the underlying principle is to transform medicine by rebalancing immune responses that cause systemic and, and chronic diseases. And we really use real world evidence, molecular insights, clinical data to advance precision medicine, also in immunology. And there are several important principles in this work. One, to really deeply understand the science and, and the common nodal pathways in immunology. And specifically, we're focusing on respiratory diseases, dermatology, and GI disorders. Um, and then supporting the, the concept of a, of a pipeline in a medicine coming from those nodal pathways, really with the ability where you address a specific path, where you also have the ability to address a variety of diseases with, with just one medicine. And then finally, uh, understanding the patient journey, which I think is, is very important in this setting. And just as an example, when, when a patient has atopic dermatitis, uh, which is a skin disease, they usually go through different stages in their journey. They, they start with a topical that is applied to the skin, then they go to an oral medicine, then they go to a biologic. And really understanding this journey and having medicines available for the patient all along those journey all along that journey is, is one of our principles. So we are now leaders in type two information and, and we are exploring different ways to rebalance, rebalance the immune response and building a rich pipeline of, of first in class and best in class medicines for type two information and really beyond that. And, and the beauty of immunology is also that it can be a red thread through the portfolio, also extending into neurology, for example, with neuroimmunology or into oncology with immuno-oncology, just to name a few. Then the other area I I'm really excited about is artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the application of sophisticated AI and machine learning methods to shorten drug discovery timelines to design higher quality and better targeted medicines for patients and streamline the clinical development process from end to end is, is what really has uh, made a difference for us. Just as an example, we are improving clinical trial efficiency by using real world evidence to then reduce the number of patients that must be enrolled and then to enable those participants in trials to provide their data and, and their, their digital biomarkers also remotely. Or we have an 
multitude of innovative AI and machine learning applications that have accelerated really our research process, and we can talk more about that, across different areas like immunology, neurology, oncology, rare blood disorders, rare disease or, or vaccines. And then finally, um, what's really close to my heart is, is diversity and inclusion. And, and that's embedded now in every aspect of the development of medicines. Um, there's also been a focus from you know, a regulatory perspective to diversity and inclusion. And, and I think also from a patient advocacy perspective, the way that we approach diversity and inclusion at Sanofi is to embed it in every aspect of medicine and, and vaccines development. And that begins with the teams that develop the medicines and continues with the patients and the community groups uh, that inform our research all the way um, then to diversity in clinical trials where we have set diversity goals for every one of our uh, clinical studies. So those are just some of the aspects that, that I, I think are really important in where we are in research and innovation at Sanofi today. So let me, um, let me be a little bit um, of a devil's advocate here, if you don't mind. Every presentation I go to, every discussion there is, AI is always brought up. It's almost become a buzzword. It's so artificial sometimes that you say, well, it's a proper name, artificial intelligence. So let's be a little more specific for our audience. You know, the drug development, research and development process is multiple step. Tell us what specifically, not generally, because some of the things you talk about are really just using digital information in a better way. I mean, real world evidence, we did that before AI, right? So I'm just pushing on you. Tell me yeah. in discovery, what does AI do for you that you think has the most potential, right? What in, in terms of uh, preclinical work, how can you use AI to improve the success rates? Because that's what you're talking about. Success rate of both the, the medication that you choose, the drugs that you choose, and their clinical development. And then, you know, for patients, population health, how do you really use AI to better use the uh, therapies we have to treat them better? So, so I'm a, a you know, the skeptical guy, convince me. <laughs> yeah, very fair, very fair. Because I, I agree with you, right? It, it's, it's often used um, as a buzzword, and, and we really need to make sure that, that we understand what, what embedding AI in the R&D process um, really means. So two aspects here. One is really, in general, where do we use AI? And, and I think that there are three key areas. Um, one is the extraction of knowledge. And that's really this, this ability of managing large data sets, and, and, and I'm still more general, I'm, I, I'll get to the more, uh, to, to the more concrete, right? But, but that's really having the ability to, for example, cover the existing literature entirely and extract knowledge, or to look at large databases of patient information and again, extract knowledge. Then the next step is how can we translate that knowledge into insights? Um, that we then use, for example, in, in modeling and multimodal drug discovery, um, and, and how can those insights be applied? And then the third step is, and, and I'll get to the specifics, is really then content generation, right? How can we utilize the knowledge that we've extracted, the insight that we've generated, and how can we communicate that, which is then really in the, in the world of large language models, where we think about how can we generate text, how can we help with study report generation, how can we help with, with education awareness, et cetera, et cetera. How I like to think, it, to, to think about it in, in a more concrete way is to look at the different steps that, that we have to complete in R&D, and think about how is AI helping us and how can it help us even more in the future. So the first step I, I think we will all agree is, is really target discovery and then discovery of drugs that can interrupt that biology and, and can hit onto those targets, right? Um, in drug discovery, there's we have a group that, that we call precision, precision medicine and computation biology, where we're looking at, you know, 
genomics data, proteomics data, uh, precision medicine data, and we're trying to correlate those and we're trying to address, you know, if we if we have a specific disease, specific disease endotype, specific underlying biology, how can we identify targets that drive that biology? And, and we've actually identified several targets coming from that work um, that where we said these are driving biology, these are new targets that we want to develop medicines against. Uh, which then will allow us to really interrupt disease biology. So that's our first step, really precision medicine, computation biology, proteomics, genomics, et cetera, making sense of those large data sets that you have in those areas. Second step is you have a target. You can nowadays describe a target, which is usually a, a, a protein, and the folding three-dimensionally. Three There's the new AI systems that now allow us to have the three-dimensional structures of those proteins in a rather rapid fashion, and then to design molecules that bind to those proteins to the active sites to really interrupt the biology. And earlier, we had to like make all those molecules, develop a high throughput screening, and then see, do we have an impact on that biology? Nowadays, nowadays we can do a lot of that in silico. We're trying to do that basically in the computer, we generate those molecules. We know their properties already uh, in silico, and then we can model how do they bind to the target and what's the optimal, optimal molecule that we want to select. And instead of making hundreds and thousands of molecules, maybe we just make a dozen and have some molecule that really interrupts the biology. Then we have to take that molecule into the clinic. And again, um, in the clinical trial, because we know so much more about you know, the properties of the molecule, we can, we can already simulate outcomes of the clinical study. And that's based on the properties of the molecule, but also on what we call disease modeling and then pharmacokinetic modeling, which has been around for some time. Uh, but really having those model systems and, and trying to predict the outcome of the clinical trial helps us in designing the study, designing inclusion exclusion criteria, um, and really driving, driving the, the development process at, at that stage. We also use AI and machine learning in indication selection, really thinking about what are the right indications for a specific biology, where does the literature tell us that biology could uh, could play a role. So we again at knowledge extraction and insight generation. Uh, and which diseases do we actually want to test? That becomes really important again, um, for example, when we think about immunology and these underlying biologies, the nodal pathways that play a role in different types of diseases. So now can we model which disease to, to choose for a specific trial? We've done that quite successfully with, with dupixent, which is our molecule that, that addresses uh, type 2 inflammation. When we think about the diseases we've chosen for development, that was entirely based on AI and machine learning models, plus then, of course, uh, clinical insights. And then I like to speak about, you know, really the, the data that we generate in the clinic. I think the biggest advantage there is that we can take data for example, directly from, from healthcare systems, from electronic health records, we can put those data uh, together with our genomics databases, with our precision biomarkers, et cetera, uh, and put those data then forward, even all the way to uh, the regulators to make sure they have the, the original data. That's more of a data flow question, less of an AI and machine learning question, but it just fits to this idea of really managing data in, in a different way. And then I would say when we get into, into kind of the, the post-marketing setting, thinking about how we manage large pharmacovigilance data sets. For example, you have developed a vaccine that is, that is utilized in literally millions of, of patients and you get feedback reports on, on adverse events, on efficacy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can use AI these days to, to uh, manage those data sets and to find signals to basically the, the signal identification, signal detection, signal identification step um, is helped quite a bit by, by AI and machine learning. And again, then afterwards you need, of course, medical analysis uh, to see what you make out of the signal, how do you mitigate it, how do you move forward? 
But uh, I hope what I'm telling you is AI can play a role across the R&D continuum. And we at Sanofi are really planning to be, an, to be a company that drives this development and is at the forefront of AI embedded in the R&D process. Thank you. Uh, so it's not just a buzzword, it's a real disruptor. It's going to yep. disrupt every stage of the R&D process and guide both generating new insights, being able to analyze larger data set dynamically. And so it's, it's interesting uh, that, that you're basically saying it's going to be transforming many of the aspects of R&D. But one thing I noticed in your uh, CV and actually our CEO, our chair, uh, Dr. Parikh, who is CEO of AAAS, is going to talk today about workforce, uh, research workforce. And uh, in 2006, you had an interview, which we pulled uh, when we did the research, and you already talked about that then. <laughs> research, work workforce, workforce diversity, and so on. So tell us what the trajectory has been. What have you noticed between 2006 and now that we should share and, and tell us where you think the future is going to be, not just for the workforce, for the patients as well. Yeah, that, that, that's that's great, Elias. I'm not even aware that I spoke in 2006 already about diversity in, in the workplace. Um, but I can tell you that that it has been close to my heart for, for quite some time because I think um, I, I'm convinced that diversity in a team, diversity in your workforce um, does lead to better outcome. And, and there's so much research that supports that concept um, that, that I think it, it's part of the, the success that, that we're having as an organization. Um, but when we reflect on where we are in 2023 versus 2006, um, I believe that specific aspect of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is playing a much more pivotal role year after year in, in how we approach workforce, but also how we approach drug development and how we approach community initiatives, because we're part of a, of a community that's, that's broader and, and we need to um, really reflect on, on those areas to have a, a strong place and a strong voice in, in that community. To, just again, to go to an example, I think the medical community and especially pharma is, is running on a, on a trust deficit. And, and we're often speaking about medical trust and distrust. And we have this opportunity to earn back some of that trust by facilitating productive conversation on health inequities, on underserved and um, on underserved medical communities and, and really to make an impact there. We both have to listen, but also we have to act on the insights. So improving diversity within the healthcare workforce is an imperative, not only for Sanofi, I, I think it's more of a, of a national task as well, uh, to reduce bias. And therefore it has to be a key area of focus for, for all of us. We have taken... Uh, specific steps in order to increase the diversity of our workforce. We've established health, ex health equity accelerator awards. We're working more broadly, um, uh, for example, with, with uh, uh, historically Black uh, colleges and universities. We're working with Beacon of Hope. Um, we also published our first patient community charter, which outlines our commitment to you really listen to, to engage with, to support patients. And this charter deepens our mission and focus on the global, global patient and, and health communities that we serve. By the way, we've developed the charter uh, using feedback from 80, 80 different patient advocacy groups and caregivers and organizations from across the world, again, representing that type of diversity. You know, it's interesting <clears throat> that you say that because when I was at the NIH, you know, there was sort of a mantra that said, you need to have a workforce that reflects the people you serve, not one kind of people serving another kind of people. And that was thought to be at the time, a major cause for lack of participation uh, in trials of minorities and underserved communities, right? Since then, and I've heard this since 2002, we still have a disconnect and if you look at the FDA, the FDA now is getting harder on having representation of minorities and underserved communities. Congress is doing the same thing. Two questions. Why have we not made progress, in your opinion, 
to the extent that we wished for 20 years ago? And what are the factors that you would you know, wish to influence to make that happen better uh, in the future? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you, Elias. And, and as you know, right, in 2022, the FDA even issued a new draft guidance document to the industry for developing plans to enroll more participants from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups into the uh, in the US in, into clinical trials. So, so it's an ongoing issue. And another area where we've seen this is, you know, when we went through the COVID pandemic, when we went through vaccinations and, and how the, the different ethnic uh, populations in the US were affected and uh, what we were able to do to overcome that. And, and in my mind, um, it takes a real dedicated effort. It, it also takes time. Uh, trust comes back in and really this question of how do you reach out to different communities? Uh, how can we be more purposeful in those areas? At, at Sanofi, um, what we're trying to do is to make clinical trials more inclusive through a bold and, and also intentional approach. So what we're trying to understand um, for each disease that, that we're trying to develop a medicine for is first and foremost, um, what is the unique, again, journey of patients uh, in that specific area, what is the ethnic representation of the different patient groups um, and the different populations in that disease type? For example, we know that coming back to an immunologic disease in asthma, uh, that ethnic groups are represented very differently. If you go to inner city asthma, which is a, a major problem, you see underserved communities, underrepresented communities affected more frequently uh, than, than your typical white population. So it's, a, it's really a, a question of understanding the diversity in the disease and then to set goals for improving diversity in your clinical trial. But then the next question becomes, and, and we have goals for 100% of our clinical trials in place. And then the next question becomes, how do you achieve those goals? And there, yes, we need a diverse workforce ourselves in Sanofi. We're not there yet. We're working on it. It's, it's one of our key objectives. Um, and we have made clear progress there. Uh, but it extends beyond that. It, it extends to where are our clinical trial sites? Who are our investigators? Who are we working with? And then again, these initiatives such as Beacon of Hope come in, which is an alliance to increase the number of diverse investigators in clinical studies, which is really important. So we have a, a broad array of activities that go all the way from what's our own workforce, what's our understanding of disease, how do we approach patients and communities, and what's the diversity of investigators that we work with. And we feel this approach is working. It will still take time, but it will increase diversity and inclusion of clin in clinical trials. And this approach has also been recognized, for example, by the Reuters Events Pharma Awards mm -hmm. and also the Bioethics Internationals uh, Pharma Scorecard Award, which we have received. This is an area, Dietmar, where I think AI could help tremendously because anecdotally, I can tell you that we researched the topic and there's a famous paper by Raynor Kington, who was the deputy director at Zeke Emanuel, looking at the root cause of why, why was there an underrepresentation? <clears throat> and there, was, there were a lot of theories about that, that people are distrustful of the white medical system and they did not want to be exposed or be guinea pigs. There were past histories, all of these explanations. And you know what we found? There was a study that we did in Jackson, Mississippi, 600. Uh, practices. And what we found to be the number one reason is that the patients were not being asked to participate. But when asked, 78% said they would. And so the question is, how do you get to ask them and have them participate? I think it, it also relates to education, socioeconomic status, regions of the country. I really think AI might be a, a major, but that's my own opinion. I, I don't want to to, um, you know, to influence you, but I think what you're doing is the beginning of a response that needs to happen. I mean, we cannot continue like this. And, you know, uh, distrust is always something that comes up, as you said, uh, you, you had a nice way of saying it, uh, a distrust uh, ratio or whatever you said uh, um, that wasn't positive. 
And I think the pharma industry is suffering even more so now because of pricing and the fact that the American uh, population pays more than in other countries. You know, there's a bipartisan agreement that this has to change. Pharma is made, being made the villain of the healthcare crisis, although it represents a small percentage. It's just one of the many factors. So from this point of view, there was a law passed called the Inflation Reduction Act. And, and I had a question for you from your point of view as an R&D person, what would you think the impact of that would be and how would it change your strategies, your, your approach to the portfolio that you were talking about? at the beginning of the talk here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, before I go there, let me just say, connecting the dots between AI and diversity is actually absolutely a part of what we're trying to do. We have so much data these days that, that especially in the US, we know where patients with specific diseases are because you even get, get data from individual private practices. Mm -hmm. And you can utilize those data, you can analyze those, you know, based on AI algorithms, and you can then go intentionally to those practices also where the more diverse patients are, and you can start asking. So you're absolutely right. That's also our, our experience, and you need to connect the dots here and, and use the technology to really get to the outcome of a more diverse patient population. Getting to the IRA, yeah, I, I fully understand. We've watched that very carefully as well. Um, it's a well-intentioned policy, of course, right? But it can have uh, adverse effects and, and uh, we need to understand those and, and draw our own conclusions uh, from those. Some elements of the IRA, for example, when we, we talk about the, the inflation penalties, do not cause us particular concerns because we all already have our own pricing principles which are well regarded in place. And those ensure that our price increases are normally in line with inflation, our drugs remain uh, accessible to patients. Um, but there's also the, the price negotiation element of the IRA, and that will have an impact on both uh, science and patients. Again, because a lot of our portfolio is really biologics, we are, we are less impacted, um, but that shouldn't keep us from you know, thinking about these decisions and, and how will they impact um, progress? How will they impact R&D? And, and how will they impact development of, of new medicines for patients? And let me just you know, give you one example. Uh, again, going back to Dupixent, which is our molecule for type 2 inflammation. Uh, this was first approved in 2017 for atopic dermatitis. And subsequently, we've been investing in extending the use of Dupixin for other important diseases. And uh, recently we embarked on a pretty high risk endeavor to, to test whether um, you know, there would be efficacy also in treating COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is the second leading cause of death worldwide, and which is a disease that has not seen any meaningful treatment innovations in well over a decade, maybe even two or three decades. And earlier this year, we announced positive results from a phase three study, which is again, based on understanding the disease biology, going into type two inflammation, um, and really offering hope for patients with, with this terrible disease. If you know this medicine is ultimately approved to treat COPD many years after the first launch, um, with the IRA price negotiations applying, um, then very little time would be left um, in order to really um, further benefit from, from this innovation. And this type of, of decision-making is, you know, then, then influencing what type of additional indications are we, are we able to research and what type of additional indications um, are we bringing to patients. So, so it's really about justifying risk for investment, but also um, bringing innovation forward to patients. And in this example, an IRA may inadvertently uh, result in less scientific progress and in missed opportunities to develop effective new therapies. Well, we're running out of time and I wanted to uh, thank you again. I mean, you've been extremely clear in your uh, you know, positions and understanding of the situation. I think the IRA is going to disturb the whole strategy of portfolio development, as you said, because uh, you don't want to develop a small indication first and 
then waste time, lose time of the 13 years to, to get to a large indication like COPD last. So you, you might invert things and, and many other consequences, including uh, perhaps reduction in R&D budgets, which will lead to reduction in, in the amount of innovation. But I leave you here. I want to thank you on behalf of the forum and having participated and really uh, sharing with you a very, very direct um, feedback to us. Thank you, Dietmar. Thank you, Elias. Thanks thank for having everybody me. for listening. Elias and Dietmar, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, very interesting and informative. A lot of important topics you covered there. Um, next up in uh, at the bottom of the hour, uh, we will have a, a segment that I think you'll find very compelling. It's from a gentleman named Russ Paulson. He's a tireless advocate for Alzheimer's research. He's CEO of Us Against Alzheimer's and also a caregiver himself. And he reminds us that all family and loved ones are why we do the things that we do in this whole mission. So join us back in the lobby uh, at 2.30 uh, Eastern time. Thank you. And thanks again, Elias and Dimar. Thank you, Derek, for having us. You bet. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Really